Amen. Jude chapter 1. I was uh, looking at this, uh, this particular passage of Scripture and I found this to be interesting because in Jude, uh, the book of Jude, I, I keep a record back all the way to 1992. 1992 of every sermon I've ever preached. It's cataloged. It's in, the, it's, in, it's in the computer. I can go back and see which verse I've used, what the title was, what the text was. And if I need to, I can pull resources from those uh, sermons. Like if I'm preaching from Jude, I can go back and say, what was I talking about from those particular messages? As I was going back this week and looking at all of those messages down through the years, hundreds of them, if not thousands of messages that I've preached, I've never preached a message out of Jude. Ever. Now, I have referenced the book of Jude, but I have never preached a message out of Jude. Uh, as the Lord was leading me to it, I went back to look, and I'm like, wow, this is amazing. So this is going to be interesting today. Amen. This is new for me, new for you, so it's good. There's a lot to be preached in the Bible. Amen. There's a lot of things that we can learn. Here is one of them. Jude chapter 1, starting at verse number 17. But you, beloved ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. That they were saying to you in the last time, there will be mockers, following after their own ungodly lusts. These are the ones who cause divisions, worldly minded, devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, Keep yourselves in the love of God and looking forward to the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. And have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. In this book of Jude, it is a letter consisting of of only 25 verses. It is a very short letter, a short book in the New Testament written to a general Christian audience by Jude, the half-brother of Jesus. Matthew 13 and verse 55 actually calling him Judas. Judas, English translations calling him Jude probably for the same reason no one in this present time will name their kid Judas because of, his, his, because of his association with the one, Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus. Nobody wants to call their kid that name. So Jude it is, and he went with Jude. Well, Jude, along with his brother James, didn't follow Jesus while they were alive, or while he was alive, rather. Uh, it was only after the crucifixion, it was only after the resurrection that these brothers began to walk in the faith and become followers. And with that following, a powerful faith in Jesus as they traveled and ministered and preached the gospel to their generation. Well, as Jude opens this letter, verse 3 says this, Friends, I've been trying to write to you about our common salvation. But these days my heart is troubled, and I'm compelled to write to you and encourage you to continue struggling or contend for the faith that was entrusted to the saints once and for all. You see, by this letter being so short, what Jude was trying to say was uh, something of importance. He wasn't mincing words. He only did it in 25 verses. So he's trying to get his message across very quickly. So he took this bold step of exposing false prophets and false teachers who had entered the church and marketing their products that were unnoticed by the faithful. Those who were within the, the faith. Those who were in the house of God. It was Jude through this letter that sought to heighten their awareness to the believers by revealing the false and encouraging all believers to stand firm in the faith and fight for the truth. Now in this day and age, fighting for truth has become rude, hasn't it? It's become rude. It's become intolerant to others. People looking for a softer, they're looking for a kinder side of the Christian faith. They want to be able to come to church and as the scripture says, find their ears tickled. Find, their, find, their, find what they're looking for. To find this soft gospel to allow them to live the they, way they want but also to have this relationship with Jesus. Well, it was Jude who reminds us 
that there's a time to stand. Once again, he didn't speak very long, 25 verses. He didn't speak long, didn't write this letter very long. But there's a time to stand. And yes, when necessary, the aggressive protection of the truth from those who aim to tear it down. Well, as Jude revealed their sinful practices, including rejecting authority and seeking to please themselves, Jude was calling the believer back to faith, back to that which was taught by the apostles, reminding them and us, Verse 18, in the last time, or in the last days, there will be mockers following after their own godly lust. You see, the last days hadn't just begun. Did you know that? Did anybody think that we are living in the last days? Or We are. But the last days didn't just begin. We're not just now living in the last days. When we go back to Joel's prophecy... Peter making mention of it in his sermon in Acts chapter 2 when he stood up with the eleven on that faithful day at Pentecost and began to preach to those who had gathered in Jerusalem. He said, but this is what has been spoken through the prophet Joel, talking about the outpouring of the Spirit. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour out my Spirit on my, all mankind. Well, the pouring out of the Spirit came at Pentecost. Amen? The pouring out of the Spirit came in Acts chapter 2 when the disciples, when the, when the apostles uh, were filled with the baptism in the Holy Spirit. We've been living in the last days since the Holy Spirit was given to the church and, came, and we came to be the church. These are the last days. For some 2,000 years we've been living in the last days. You see, from this day, from that day rather to this day, there have been people of dissension in the church. Paul dealt with it. Peter dealt with it. They caused division. They're worldly minded, the scripture says. They're devoid or lacking of the spirit. Division begins when we choose to compromise the word of God. That's when division begins to take place within a church. When we choose to compromise the Word of God. When we choose to cater to the world or following our own godly lusts as Jude puts it here in his book. Can you see how that can cause strife and division? Not only in the church, but in you. Because that is two separate camps, my friend. That is two separate, uh, two separate messages fighting for prominence inside of your life. And only one can be right. And it's not your sin. There's two messages. But only one can be right. And this is why Jude is so adamant. This is why Jude is so direct when he is writing this letter. This is why Jude warns believers saying to you, but you, but you, giving us direction as a believer in this moment how we're supposed to live. So as we follow Jude through this letter, he informs us of our opposition. He informs us of what's happening within the, the culture of the church. But he's very clear on how we're to respond. And Jude commanded us, number one, to pray in the Holy Spirit. So if you're taking notes, write that down. Jude commanded us to pray in the Holy Spirit. When trouble arises, when we see all of these things coming to pass, pray in the Holy Spirit. You see, the birth of the church came to be in Acts chapter 2 with the promise of the Father. The giving of the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out on the 120 believers who had gathered together in the upper room and had continued to pray and waited together for the promise. Acts chapter 2 saying, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Verse 4 saying, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking with a different tongues as the Spirit was giving them the ability to speak out. It was P the Peter in his message that went on to share in verses 38 and 39 of that same chapter. He said, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far away, even as many as the Lord our God will call to Himself. You see, this gift 
was manifested in the life of a believer through the evidence of an unknown tongue, a prayer language to be exercised by all who consider themselves a believer. Paul the Apostle saying about himself, I speak in tongues more than you all do. And in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians where you find him saying that, he also says in verse 5, I wish that you all spoke in tongues. Now that's the Apostle Paul, the writer of the New Testament, two-thirds of it. He said, I speak in tongues more than you all, and I wish that you all spoke in tongues. What was he saying? Just for the sake of speaking in tongues? No, that you would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This gift that comes to your life, the promise of the Father, the gift of tongues, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. You see, it wasn't uncommon to the early church. It was there some 25 years after the promise was given at the day of Pentecost. It was Paul who was still asking the question to new believers who were, first, who were getting saved and coming to the knowledge of faith in the city of Ephesus. Acts chapter 19 and verse 2. He asked those disciples, those young believers, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Did you receive I'm asking you the same question today. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Have you received the gift that God has given us? And when Paul had laid hands upon him, verse 6, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. Acts 19, 6. 25 years after Pentecost. You see, the early church lived the command with the need for the Holy Spirit, with the need for the gift of the Holy Spirit. They practiced and taught that we must be filled with the Spirit, with the evidence of a prayer language in a believer's life. In the midst of trouble, in the the midst of of false teachers and false preachers and false uh, uh, disciples rising in the church, how important is it for us to be filled with the Spirit? How important is it for us to exercise this gift in our lives? And as Jude commanded, to pray in the Holy Spirit. There was an article that came to me uh, from our fellowship. Uh, I have it here. And I I wanted to share a part of it with you because it it really is overwhelming uh, in some extent, to some extent. It talked about a Barna research. Anybody ever heard of Barna? Barna does the researches of uh, the church. And the last Barna research indicates that out of every 100 Americans, only six embrace a biblical worldview. A biblical worldview. That's only 6%, church. 6%. Now think about that. Incredibly, 51% claim they have a biblical worldview. In this same research, only 51% said they had a biblical worldview. But when you question their beliefs in detail, you discover the tragic truth. They don't know what biblical worldview is. Reincarnation is possible, they said. That's not in Scripture. Jesus isn't the only way for salvation. That's not in Scripture. Americans don't know what biblical means anymore. 41% believe that the Bible, the Quran, and the Book of Mormon express the same divine truths. It doesn't. It doesn't. On surveys inquiring about America's religious affiliation, there's a fast-growing trend. Today, 22.8% of all Americans answer none, which means they have no affiliation with any type of body of believers. No church whatsoever. Millennials, ages 24 to 40 years old, identify as Christian in great numbers, 61%. But only 2% of them actually hold a biblical worldview. Among young people now in their teenage years, 40% claim no religious affiliation whatsoever. Some 60% of all American teens admit they've never read Scripture on their own. 60%. 45 percent, those who claim to be Christians as well as those who don't believe all religions teach equally valid truths. Do you see where that becomes a conflict within the church? 
Do you see where that becomes a conflict within you as a believer? When we invite other things into our life that is not sound, that's not based on the Word of God, which is absolute truth, This is God's love letter to you and to me and how we're supposed to live in this world. And when we dismiss it from our life and we invite other things in, there is a contradiction that is happening in you. There is not a biblical worldview that's taking place, but it's simply a worldview that you hold at that point in time. And you just happen to salt and pepper it with the Bible. It doesn't work. And it's not true. And that's what Jude was talking about in, these very sh- in this very short letter. That what he's finding within the church today are deceivers, are people who are causing dissension because they're not heeding to the Word of God. And because of it, it causes strife and division in you individually and even as a body of believers. As we hear one side say, this is what we have to do, and another side say, this is what we have to do. But what does the Bible say? What does the Bible call us to? What has it called us to be? What does the Bible say that we are? How much, how important is it for us to be filled with the baptism in the Holy Spirit? With the evidence of an unknown tongue. We know the gift, the baptism of the Holy Spirit gives us power. To be witnesses. We read that in Acts chapter 8, or chapter 1, verse 8. But praying in the Holy Spirit accomplishes many more things in your life. And one of those that Jude points out is building yourself up in the faith, the scripture says. You see, when you pray in the Spirit, you encourage yourself, you propel yourself, you build your House. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and 14 and verse 4, it tells us the one who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. Do you hear the scripture? The one who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. What does edify mean there? When you go back to the original Greek, it means to build a house, to erect a building. So we could say the one who speaks in a tongue builds his own house. You are building yourself up. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that you're building yourself up? Well, the short version would be this. There's a perfect, unhindered communication between the born-again Spirit of a person and the Spirit of God. You're praying a perfect prayer. Because when you yield your tongue to the Holy Spirit and you begin to pray in the Spirit, you're praying a perfect prayer. It's not impeded by your emotion. It's not impeded by your thought. It simply pursues the will of God as you yield to the Holy Spirit to pray. To pray. And it's in that prayer, it's in exercising that gift that has already been given on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, he gave it to the church. Peter, 25 years later, still saying, have you received the gift since you believed? It is that gift that continues to edify and build you up and helps you to know what is right and what is wrong in the midst of a world that can't make heads or tails out of truth. It's the Word of God. It's the Spirit of God that bears witness. You see the result being Romans chapter 8 and verse 16 which says the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. That we are sons. That we are daughters today. How much would it help you to be reminded that you're a son and that you're a daughter? Because many times we forget. Many times uh, we, 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 we consider ourselves uh, something else, not a son or not a daughter. But you're sons and daughters if you put your faith in Jesus Christ. And He longs to give you a gift that helps you to build your faith. Praying in the Spirit builds your house. And it's a continual reminder of who and whose you are in this world. In these days filled with trouble, may we heed Jude's command to pray in the Holy Spirit. And if you haven't experienced this wonderful gift that He gives, has given to the church, the gift of the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of praying in this miraculous language, this miracle language, this gift of tongues, however you want to say it, simply ask Him. John chapter, or excuse me, Luke chapter 11, verse 13, Jesus said, 
So if you, despite being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How many know how to give good gifts to your children? Yeah, we try to bless them. We try to bless them as well as we can. How much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? This is Jesus saying about the gift. How much more will He be willing to give you the Holy Spirit if you ask Him? Second, today Jude encourages us to stay in the love of God. To stay in the love of God. You don't have to read very far in the Bible to understand that God so loved the world. We know that, amen? That He loves the world. But many times it's easy to question not that He can't or not that He hasn't loved me, but why would He love me? Anybody in the room? Why would He love me? Why would God love me, a sinner? Why would God love me, who is prone to making mistakes? Why does God love me in the midst of my struggle, in the midst of my fight, in the midst of me getting it wrong from day to day or from time to time? Why does He continually love me? Why would He love me, a sinner? You see, salvation reveals to us that He loved us even when we were in our sin. He loved us when we were lost and when we were undone, when we were a stranger, when we were away from Him. The Scripture says that He died for us in those moments. And it's in that reality that we're able to express our love to God. On some, on, on some level, we offer our love to the Lord, whether it be in our worship, whether it be in our prayers, whether it be in our just seated in silence in His presence. I, I, I don't know how you offer your love to the Lord, but we offer that love to Him. But it's entirely something else to understand the revelation of His love to us and how He loves you. In spite of who we are, come on, in spite of what we've done, in spite of our sin, our ungodly lust, as Jude puts it. You see, embracing God's love is the secret of being an overcomer. The greatest weapon of defeating your enemy or this trouble that has come to us, the trouble that comes to our door many times, is to be convinced of His love for you. Knowing that this God, the Creator God, loves you individually as a person. You see, church, when Jesus prayed for His disciples on the night of His crucifixion, catch this. John 17 verse 23 says, Jesus prayed that His disciples would know that God loved them just as He loved Jesus. Does that impact you like it does me? That Jesus prayed for His disciples, you, as well as the eleven who were with Him that night, that they would know your love, that He, God, my Father, loved them as much as you loved me. You see, can you see the implications of His prayer? Just as the Lord, the Father, loved Jesus in eternity, he loves us. He loved us, providing for our redemption, knowing us even in our unformed substance found inside of our mother's womb. We, he, 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 he said that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Ephesians chapter 1, God withheld nothing to love us, not even His Son. But He gave everything He had to show us and for us to understand that this God, loves you as an individual. In all your ups and all your downs and all your ins and all your outs, all your junk, He loves you like He loves Jesus. Wow. I don't know about you, but that is overwhelming to me to know that God loves me like He loves His Son. You see, Jude is saying, keep yourself in the love of God. Stay inside the Word of God. Understand who you are, who you are in His presence, and keep this truth. Never let it go. It's in this knowledge, this faith, in the relationship that He alone provides we stand. It's in this relationship we live. It's in this relationship that we move, that we have our being, and that we're able to love in return. Finally today, Jude challenges us to live in the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. To live in the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look again 
at Jude chapter 1, verse 21. I'm reading from the voice. Wait eagerly for the mercy of our Lord Jesus the Anointed, which leads to eternal life. Keep being kind to those who waver in this faith. Pursue those who are singed by the flames of God's wrath and bring them safely to Him. Show mercy to others with fear, despising every garment soiled by the weakness of human flesh. You know, we have a tremendous hope because of the mercy that has been given to us. We see that there is a promised reward. We see that there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. We know that the Scripture tells us that He has gone to prepare a place for us, that where He is, we may be also. And if He's gone to prepare a place for us, the Bible says that He is going to come and receive us unto Himself, that where He is, we may be also. There is an eternal life that God has given us in this relationship. Well, it's because of the mercy we've been given. Jude challenges us today to live there with others, to offer mercy in the life of others, being kind to those who waver in the faith. And as we've learned in week two, to also to pray for the prodigals, those who have left the fold, those who have allowed the world to get into them to the place where they have walked away from the body of Christ and they trusted what was in the world more so than what they know is true in the Word of God. But not only praying, pursuing them. And bringing them safely back to Him. Did you hear that command from Jude? We want, to, we, want to, we want to be there for those individuals and not allow those who have wavered in faith. We want to bring them back and present them to God. That means that there is something that we've been called to do inside of this mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. That we have a task in front of us. May we show mercy as God showed mercy in our lives. May we realize that people have fallen away from the truth and there are people to come, that those folks need to come back to the truth. Not approving of the garment that's soiled by the weakness of the human flesh. Anybody? Come on. I know what it means. I know what that verse means. Because my, my garment has been soiled because of my fleshly uh, desires in my own life. And I've had to bend my knee But the Bible says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness. We have to present ourselves to God. And the Lord is asking us today not to approve of those things, but by offering the love of God so the wayward would be reminded of His love and would come home. We chase them. We pursue them. And Jesus is our example who went to seek and to save that which is lost. That He didn't come to be served, but to Sir, how much more should we, those who have received His mercy, give mercy? Wow. Give mercy. You see, in this truth, Jude is reminding us of our purpose. Finding life in our mission. We have a mission. You remember that unfamiliar verse that says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel? (laughs) I think it's a little more than unfamiliar. It's the Great Commission to you and me today. That there are people who are lost and unbelieving. There are people who are wayward away from the faith. And He has placed us on mission. Have mercy for them. Jude said, but you. But you. He was focusing on the church. But you. Troubles will arise. Enemies will invade the church to exploit And to deceive. And in some circles of faith, we have seen the acceptance of so many ungodly things. Where it's become a normal thing because it's a softer gospel. We're wanting to include all people. Well, God wants to include all people as well. But according to His Word. Because He realizes that in ourselves are ungodly desires that cause destruction in our lives. And by coming to faith in Him and knowing the guideline, the highway, the guardrails, however you want to say it, we can walk this relationship out with Him every day. God has more for us 
than what we think we have for ourselves. And in the midst of all of the trouble, in the midst of all of the things that are coming our way, and it's happened ever since the day of Pentecost, as false teachers rise, as false leaders come, as false disciples present themselves, it's in the midst of these three things that we'll stand holding to the truth of the gospel we've received. But you, pray in the Spirit, stay in the love of God, and live in the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. He gives us a mission in that process. It's in that posture, that place, that not only will you be preserved, but you will be a witness of what the gospel can do in the life of another who so desperately needs the gospel. I don't know about you, but my, my, I want my life to impact another. Don't you? Don't you want to impact another life? Don't you want to see your life being used for His purposes in this generation? Don't you want to see your life bringing glory and honor to His name? I think you do. But we have to come to that place of realizing and understanding that there is a way, the way, and it's Jesus. Amen? It's the way. Jude gives us some great steps. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Stay in the love of God. And live in the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. May we apply those to our lives and hear the word from Jude.